Thank you very much for the invitation to come down uh, and address you all uh, here in Cork. It's, it's a couple of years since I, since I was in Cork City and I took the train down and uh, I brought my bike on the train so I could just pedal around Cork and uh, needless to say I got completely confused with the one-way streets and I thought Dublin was bad on one-way streets but uh, Cork is, 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 uh, is up there with, with Dublin in terms of um, uh, difficulty to, to find your way around uh, I, have, I have very strong theories on one-way streets. I think they're the work of the devil and should be banned. Particularly multi-lane one-way streets. Whatever about uh, single-lane one-way streets you just deal with very narrow streets. Once you start going into um, multiple one-way lanes, you basically you, you take the street and you're increasing the transport function. But it's always um, at the cost of the economic and the social function of the street. And it's a very simple lesson. And uh, I think we've got to look again at how we organise uh, traffic and transport. And I think there's a real danger in Ireland with the system that we have set up, that we allow the planners to take care of the buildings and we allow the engineers to take care of almost everything else that's outside buildings. And I think we have to do a power grab. I think as planners, as spatial planners, as urban designers, we've got to wrestle back a huge amount of that control of uh, urban uh, of the urban environment, of the street and of, of roads. Uh, and it's only then that we'll really build more civilised streets. But the nice thing about getting lost was I got to see the amazing work by, um, uh, uh, by the, the Beth uh, Gal, and I got to see the Occupy Cork camp, and I got to see the river, and uh, I really got a fantastic kind of five minute uh, whistle stop tour. Of the, of the city, and I really should be here more often. Anyway, the theme of my talk is loosely planned around, uh, around ghost estates. Um, I wasn't sure if I was kind of planning in Ireland past, present, and prospects or the lessons from ghost estates, but I think I'll use the ghost, ghost estates issue as a way to talk about the wider, uh, the wider issue of planning. And I want to look back. I want to look at the state of the world today and I want to look ahead a little bit. Um, so to begin with, let's uh, look back slightly and think about, think about the history of Ireland. Um, that was pretty much how uh, we liked others to think of how we were for a very long time. And really for, I guess, in many senses, in many senses for the first 40 years of the state there was limited development. There was some great initiatives like the Shannon Scheme, like the setting up of um, various other initiatives, but it was certainly slow growth for most of the 20s, 30s, 40s and 50s. And then there was a, a, a slow move to industrialise in the 1960s and 70s. I think the first economic uh, programme was an incredible change in whatever it was, 1958, and marked a sea change from, in a sense, an isolationist policy that had been there uh, beforehand. But uh, we ran into difficulties in the 1980s. Uh, we overspent. Uh, we didn't um, bring the public finances under control as quickly as we should have. And we ended up with one of those lost decades in the 1980s. And during the 80s, I was in UCD studying architecture. Uh, when I went in in 1982, I said to myself, It'll be fine when I come back out, the economy will be booming again and it'll be grand. Uh, I actually eventually found my way out in 1989 and things were still moving very slowly. And most of my colleagues uh, left the country, they went to the Berlins, the Barcelonas, the Bostons of this world, um, and they emigrated. And in many ways, they didn't go permanently, they didn't leave the, the island permanently, but they got some fantastic experience in those kind of cities and almost all of them came back to Ireland and almost all of them are living in Ireland now. But they brought with them the kind of the can-do attitude of the United States. They brought with them the kind of social caring economy from, uh, from Northern Europe. They brought with them the amazing new approaches to urban design and architecture from Barcelona and elsewhere. And I think that really invigorated um, the Irish construction 
and planning and design sector in the 1990s. I think it was, they brought back these great new ideas and they applied them, they applied them uh, in Ireland. So we had that kind of construction boom in the 90s and into the early 90s. Uh, and then something funny happened. Once Anglo-Irish banks started just giving mad money to people, all the other banks followed suit. And once you move from kind of 2005, 2006, suddenly things went pear-shaped. All of the banks decided that they had to follow Anglo-Irish uh, in this rush to lend money. And the construction <coughs> sector uh, went crazy. Uh, and as a result, we had the boom, the bust, and the stagnation uh, of the last five years. But some of the, some of the roots of that um, boom and bust uh, were in place from slightly earlier on. Uh, 1999, the rural renewal scheme. And you can argue that Charlie McCreevy had the best of intentions. He said very simply, uh, the Celtic Tiger had not moved into Longford, into Leitrim, into Roscommon, <coughs> elsewhere, and he saw as a very simple accounting exercise, provide tax incentives and they will come. And I think it was a dangerously short-sighted view of development. It was uh, really an appalling mistake to say, look, just give the tax breaks and we'll make development happen. Uh, and you can see, I mean, you can see his argument uh, that the section uh, the, the, the financial incentives would help these areas uh, to boom, but it was done very simply. And, you know, it would have been would have been fine if it was uh, the uh, sorry. <coughs> it would have been fine had it been several examples of uh, Ms. Connolly who was single with an income of twenty thousand, and she simply. Uh, got the reliefs on the house that she had built, but it was when it was applied to massive developments in the wrong places for the wrong reasons that things went horribly wrong. So I think Ms. Connolly, she was doing okay, but it was went on to Mr. Murphy selling the house to Mr. Fox. That's where things started to, to, to get dangerous. I'm simply just cutting and pasting a few examples from the guide that, uh, the, minister, that the Department of Finance produced. Um, and Interestingly, in the guide, they concentrated on refurbishment, on the single dwelling, on the small-scale type of development. But the way in which the tax code was written uh, allowed, essentially, people to buy up a, a, a field several miles outside the town, if there was a town, and build apartments on it. And that really was certainly the seeds of, of disaster. And I, I, I don't apologize at all for saying that one of the key problems of the boom was an absence of planning. It wasn't bad planning. More often than not, it was an absence uh, of planning. Mind you, I don't think planners should be completely uh, exonerated from blame. Uh, it was, after all, planners who did work with county managers uh, to, to permit or refuse development uh, in some highly questionable locations. Now, the conventional theory amongst the planning community is Ah, sure, it wasn't me, it was the county manager overruled my advice. I'd love to think that for many of the empty developments that the planning officer in question had recommended refusal, but I haven't had a chance to go through it, but I doubt it. I think in many cases the planning officer did recommend, uh, did recommend um, a grant of permission. And that in itself also contributed to the huge challenge that we have. County managers, I think, certainly are in the crosshairs in terms of uh, culpability for inappropriate development in the wrong areas. They are, they are basically the, the kind of the last bulwark against a complete laissez-faire approach to planning. But I, I think if we look at um, the 25 or 30,000 empty housing units around uh, the state today, they were given permission. That permission was mostly given by a county manager, in some cases, who was Board Planola. But I actually think on Board Planola comes out of this quite well. Quite often they turn down applications um, for inappropriate uh, for inappropriate development. So that 99 tax incentives, there's just a, a, a little snapshot. One of the counties um, 
much of which was included, was Cavan. Not all of Cavan. Uh, you know, we had this lovely, very precision tax incentives in the 1980s of just those parts of the cities or towns that need development that had nothing happening for many years. And that was grand. I, I mean, I had my problems with that because we lost a huge amount of heritage and archaeology in the early years. But you could accept that. You could accept that we take the, the derelict, underperforming town centres. But you, when you come in and essentially paint half the county of Cavan in one colour and say it's open season, that's where things went horribly wrong. So whether it was Dugary, Parafin, Ballymagowan, all of these townlands that I certainly don't know or uh, am too familiar with, so many of them are where the chickens have come home to roost in terms of, uh, in terms of the ghost estates. So that's kind of certainly one aspect of what has led us uh, to the challenges that are out there now. And I think that was the, the, the iconic image used for uh, the flyer for the lecture. There's a couple of other shots about that. Uh, boating from your own back door and the reality of uh, <laughs> uh, another uh, development. Um, so that, that's what we're stuck with. I mean, we, we we're all familiar with the the various photographs, uh, a few facts and figures. The good news is it's not as bad as lots of people thought it was. There were several headlines about two years ago saying there's 300,000 empty dwellings in the state. Uh, but when I was in the Department of the Environment, we carried out a survey and our conclusions were only about 25,000 units complete and vacant. There were about 10,000 that were almost complete. Um, so maybe call it 35,000 units in all. The headlines said there's 300,000 empty units out there. But what they had often done was simply take the state as a whole and look at any dwelling unit that's empty. You've got to remember, even in the best of times, around about 5 to 10 percent of housing units are vacant. I know from, uh, from having spent an awful lot of time knocking on doors, looking for votes, you go down the road, one house in ten is usually, even in the most salubrious areas of, uh, of Ireland, usually about one in ten looks like it's been empty for quite a long time. And that can be where uh, someone has died, where you're awaiting a uh, grant of probate on a will, or somebody might have left the country or headed south for winter, or there might be title problems. Quite often it takes a while. So 300,000 empty units, there may well be 300,000 empty units around the state, uh, but the extent of the problem there is about maybe 25,000 uh, units. An awful lot that are, um, uh, were given permission, but that weren't actually built, but thankfully, thankfully we, were, we were certainly spared that. Uh, and if we look at where those housing units are, um, well, they're all around the state, that's a, that's a screen grab from Aero from the All Ireland Research Observatory. Um, and it shows you the locations. Um, clustered around their major towns and cities, but you can also see that Upper Shannon scheme. I think it really, uh, once you look at that map for a few minutes, you can see the blanket-based uh, tax incentives were a real um, problem when it came to building too much uh, in the wrong locations. Um, so a real mixture, a mixture of different uh, different uh, areas, but certainly the tax incentive schemes uh, did contribute significantly to the problem. What do we do about all of that? Well, at the time that I was uh, a Minister of State in the Department of the Environment, uh, Communities and Local Government, uh, we came up with the survey and we were moving towards uh, a, a manual which essentially said, look, we need to coordinate our approach with site resolution plans tackle the public safety issues, put in uh, a, a better response framework in terms of the legislation uh, and build confidence in the housing sector again. Um, looking back at that now, um, there has been a strong move towards the site resolution plans. In many instances, the public safety issues have been tackled. Uh, it was appalling to, to read of the death of a child uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, but it is impossible to completely ensure that every building site is completely 
inaccessible to, to children. And in, in many building sites around the state, in Ballymun, uh, a child uh, lost their life. Uh, and that there, there will continue to be challenges uh, in that area. I don't think it's possible to completely put a ring, uh, a ring of steel uh, around these. And a lot depends on uh, the local authority to, to put in place decent measures. And they can use the derelict sites legislation, they can use the litter acts, they can use the, um, they can use the, the dangerous buildings legislation. And so there are, there is a menu of options that the, the local authority can use in all of this. Building confidence in the housing sector, I'm always a little bit nervous about that and I, I'm uh, quite worried about the, uh, the move by the new government to provide mortgage interest relief uh, on the purchase of buildings. I think we've got to let the housing sector find the right level of value by itself and I think this artificial stimulus on the way down can be quite dangerous and it could delay um, a sense of certainty about where the bottom is in terms of house prices in Ireland. Um, where will that bottom be? I don't know, uh, but I think a good way, a good place to look is at similar countries with similar levels of development, similar levels of uh, development. Uh, and I do know that if you look at cities like Berlin in Germany, um, the price per square metre is still lower than it is in Dublin, Ireland. So I think we should be very careful of saying we've reached the bottom here and now. But I think we need a societal change as well to uh, seeing uh, property, seeing a roof over our heads as the most important aspect of housing and not seeing it so much as something that you trade with, something that you uh, move in, move out again, keep finding your another um, kind of rung going up, a rung of the, la the ladder. I, I took, I, I had a photograph, I don't think I have it in the presentation, I was out near Belmain uh, in Dublin and there was this huge billboard with starter homes on Dublin's north side and I just thought it was so kind of pejorative of you're never going to live here forever and then this kind of, it's on Dublin's north side, only the south side are really writes down on Dublin's north side. If you live <laughs> on the north side of Dublin as I do, you never say, ah, here I am living on Dublin's north side. It, it, it always reflects a, let's, let's put some little homes that aren't really fit enough to, to live in and hope to God that they're able to sell them on after a few years. Uh, and I think that came about because of the the loose hand of regulation, the laissez-faire approach to everything from planning to um, apartment interior guidelines and everything else. And I had a huge flaming row back in the early 90s with Ken MacDonald from Hook and MacDonald, the auctioneers. Uh, and I said we were just building these shoe boxes where you couldn't uh, <coughs> swing a cat in one of these shoebox apartments. I, I said if you could swing a cat, the cat would be quite traumatised by the bruises it would receive from hitting both sides, of, both walls on both sides of the room. And thankfully, one of the things that Greens did in government was we increased the apartment size standards uh, so that new new build apartments would have a decent balcony, would have a decent storage area, would have a decent amount of light and shade, uh, of light of natural light. I think we should be going further, uh, but that's another day's work. The other thing that we did uh, in government uh, was that we brought in um, the Planning and Development Amendment Act 2000. And I don't have time to go into the detail of that, uh, but a hugely important issue was the focus on an evidence-based core strategy at the heart of uh, land use plans. And previously, we had a lot of aspirations in that direction, but it wasn't written into the Act itself. And what we've seen since that Act was passed We've seen county councils downzone land, dzone land, and provide um, strategies for which area should be built first if they're not downzoning. And I think that concentrates the right kind of uh, development in the right places, and that can, can only be uh, a good thing. We also brought in a, a betterment tax. We, we said that, look, if you upzone land, you're going to pay 80% tax on the increase in value. Nobody really noticed 
Why? It was part of the NAMA legislation. We wrote it in, uh, buried in the detail of the NAMA legislation. If you rezone land and it increases in value, 80% of that increase in value goes to the government. I think that's as close as you can get to implementing the Kenny Report from 1973 in today's environment. I think it's groundbreaking and I think it does an awful lot to try and ensure that you don't have the flahulic approach to land use rezoning that characterised the noughties, the nineties, the eighties and the seventies in so many of our towns and cities. I hope it will put some manners uh, on, on the madness. So, ghost estates aren't the biggest, I, I mean, they're, they're a hugely important issue, but actually I'm much more worried about uh, one-off housing. That's a, a map of the new postal addresses created between uh, 2005 and 2007 uh, in just a three-year period. Now, some of those postal addresses are large developments, but the overwhelming majority of the dots on that map are single dwellings uh, built in particular cases. And it looks to me that we simply have a propensity to build whatever we want, wherever we want, uh, without any great control over that. Interestingly, the, the, in terms of, of what you can learn from this map, about the only, one of the few valuable things you can learn from this map is where the mountains are. Uh, in the state, uh, because it's not that easy to get um, to get electricity uh, on top of a mountain. Um, but joking apart, uh, I, I'm hugely worried about about um, the cost to the state and to the individual of one-off housing. Uh, for me, it's not an issue of aesthetics. I, uh, I I don't really mind that much what it looks like or whether it stands out in the landscape. I really worry about the economic cost and the social cost of what the state needs to do to, to maintain um, livability in those units. If a, if a nurse has to go out and visit uh, an older person, um, it'll take an awful lot harder, a lot more time to get around to several people. If you have to deliver the post, it will cost twice as much to, to bring a letter to the door. Uh, if you want to uh, help with the provision of a, uh, a school bus, it takes an awful lot of assistance. That's from the state's perspective, but also from, um, as a Green, from the point of view of trying to tackle um, climate change emissions. What this means is that the amount of travel increases really dramatically. The amount of car travel, um, you're not going to be able to provide uh, a decent bus service to a completely dispersed population. But look, I'm sure you you. you You've looked at that, you, you know a lot about that from, uh, from your studies. But I think that's probably a, 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 much, bigger, uh, a much bigger concern, really, than uh, the problem of uh, the ghost estates themselves. But look, that's, that's kind of where we are. Uh, and actually, that was up to 2007, and just while I still have that map up there, it reminds me that in the years since 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, the ratio of single dwellings to, to multiple dwelling developments has gone through the roof. So if, you're, if there's something in the planning process now, chances are if it's a housing unit, it's for a single uh, dwelling unit. So it, in a sense, the ratio is certainly getting worse uh, and the absolute numbers are getting <coughs> worse in this score. So that's a snapshot of uh, where we were, where we are, and now the trick is to try and look ahead and see what we can do about all of this. Well, um, I think in terms of the unfinished developments, and uh, that problem it really it rests with the current government. Willie Penrose uh, inherited the portfolio I, ha I had, and Jan O'Sullivan uh, stepped in once Willie uh, stepped down. Um, and I think it's one heck of a problem. But I simply would recommend a simple system of triage, of looking at the ones that don't need much intervention, the ones that require a lot of management and innovative financing, and then simply the ones that can, should be, and will be demolished. And I think there are a significant number of developments out there that really should be 
demolished over time because the, the social, economic, and environmental costs of maintaining them are simply, uh, simply too high. What do I mean by that? Well, the good are those that will be finished and occupied without any help. Chances are they're close enough to the major urban centres or to significant places of employment. More often than not, the two of them are coincide. Um, don't need to worry too much about that. Uh, and that's, that's fairly easily uh, dealt with. The bad, in a sense, are those that require innovative management and financing. Um, and it's not easy. It's not easy for the local authority to try and address this resource. Um, the system of bonds, of uh, withholding uh, money from the developer, um, was very poorly managed during the boom years, so there isn't a pot of money that can be uh, thrown at the problem. But there is legislation, the, the Derelict Sites Act, the Dangerous Buildings legislation, sanitary services legislation, litter legislation, all of that stuff is there, but it ain't easy because quite often the developer has disappeared, the developer is in NAMA, uh, the developer is in South Australia, it's not easy to, to catch up with the individuals. And the worry at this stage, and it's a worry that uh, Jeff Colley, the editor of Construct Ireland magazine, put his finger on three or four years ago, he said there is a real danger if you build a house in Ireland and leave the windows open for several um, winters. So five years down the line, you may well have just deterioration of the building fabric and it might not be worth, uh, might, might not be worth uh, fixing. So when it comes to the ugly, in other words, those that are really beyond assistance, uh, it will tend to be the units that were poorly designed, poorly built, or poorly located, or, or the combination of all three of them. If you've just <coughs> a nasty design of housing units, if they're built in the wrong place, and if they're um, located in the wrong area, you've got a problem. And, and a development springs to mind, I think, on the shores of Loch Bree, which might have been okay as holiday apartments during the boom years. The real danger is if you take vulnerable housing unit, you, users, local authority tenants, local authority clients, and say, look, here's a fine apartment for you. How many miles is it to the school? How many miles is it to the shop? How many miles is it to the pub? There's a real danger that you, you'll end up um, getting the wrong, um, the, the more vulnerable, uh, the wrong developments with the more vulnerable users. And during that short time that I was a Minister of State, there was constantly a certain friction between myself and my colleague Michael Finnery, who was the Minister of State with responsibility for housing, where I was saying, look, we've got to be really careful here that we just don't say, ooh, look, here's a housing list, ooh, look, here's their empty, empty buildings, and marry the two, uh, because the needs of the more vulnerable housing users in society uh, demand uh, a much more managed approach than simply uh, giving people the keys, the keys of an empty housing unit. So you've got to be quite careful uh, with that, particularly when there's a complete mismatch between where the jobs are and where the people are. Uh, I mean, do you really kind of sit down and say to somebody from uh, the middle of Dublin, get the, to Carrick on Shannon because there's empty uh, apartments. If there's no jobs there, you, 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 it's very difficult to, to, to get people to get out of the cycle uh, of poverty uh, and disadvantage and, and social exclusion. And that's, that's not easy. Going back just to that issue of um, loose regulation, one of the issues that we stated in the report is we need to uh, have better phasing of development, bonds and securities, other policies about sequential and phase development. We had most of that. We had stuff that was very good on paper about carefully managing development, but we didn't apply it. And county managers and others, in their rush to have development built, they quite happily uh, allowed um, the wrong kind of development to happen, to, to, to go ahead, and uh, without, without the kind of control uh, that should have been placed from uh, from day one. That, that's a real problem. Um, so, what do we do? Uh, well, I, my strong view is that with the new planning legislation, we'll hopefully see an end to the kind of slapped up uh, apartments in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we do have, as I said earlier, the 80% windfall tax. So that is 
uh, a step in the right direction. And just finally, in terms of the empty housing units, I did. I, I remember sitting down with uh, Pat Cogan, Father Pat Cogan from Respond, which is one of the larger um, uh, social housing providers uh, in the station. I said, Pat, if you had 100 empty housing units, what would you do? He said, well, first of all, I'd look very carefully to see if I could guarantee the quality of the buildings. And we've looked at, at that stage a year and a half ago, he said, look, I've looked at half a dozen different developments. We simply don't have a chain of custody of, um, uh, of the building process. We, can't, we, we don't have certificates of compliance uh, for whether the foundations are decent, whether the units themselves are, are, are well built, etc., etc. But if we did, and if I was offered 100 housing units in the morning, I'd take 20 of them, I'd sell the other 80 uh, by auction or just sell them at whatever the market would bear. And with the 20 that I'd take, I'd, not, I, I'd use two of them and make them into uh, community rooms for, for um, uh, you know, washrooms, meeting rooms, etc., etc. And I'd put my kind of housing clients, vulnerable housing client, clients, into the 18. But I'd make sure that there was private sector housing clients right next door. Uh, and he was making a very simple point that there is a real danger that we could go back to the era of ghettoisation if you simply allocate um, the more vulnerable into large tracts of um, empty housing units. Who else can come into this whole equation? Well, the Department of the Environment is the lead agency in overseeing housing and uh, planning policy. Uh, I think they need to use all kinds of innovative methods to complete developments. And quite often the lead is coming from the local authority, from the planning authority. And you get the, the, the head of housing talking to the head of planning, talking to the county manager. And in some cases, decent solutions are coming out of that. Um, jobs, enterprise and innovation. I just threw up these other departments to say that we can turn this around a bit. If you're the IDA and you're trying to attract um, startup.com into Ireland, they're saying, look, the IDA very often is saying, look, we have a really good factory site or an existing factory that we want you to take over. They can also say, look, we have 500 housing units within a, a, a 20 kilometer radius. So it can be seen as an asset. It still can, with many units, be seen as an asset, certainly in terms of jobs and enterprise. <coughs> Education and skills, again, we can look on the map, the 20 kilometer radius or 10 kilometers from all our third level institutions. And there are still are, uh, there's massive potential for link ups between ITs, between universities, and empty housing units that are uh, a stone's throw down the road. Transport, tourism, and sport. We're getting into the theoretical stuff here, but I certainly think there's groups who might like to be in Ireland for several months of the year. If I was facing a Scandinavian winter uh, of snow and ice for four months, I'd happily uh, move to Leitrim uh, if there was a, a development close enough to the uh, village. So I think a little bit of innovation might help us to find other uses for some of these units. But I'm still saying that a lot of them don't in the future. I'm still saying the bulldozers will need to move into uh, some areas and that's, that's the way it is. Now, I, obviously I urge caution because certainly from a, from a carbon and energy perspective, there's a huge amount of embodied energy in the building. Once you build it, once you put those four walls, the concrete, the wood, all of that, you've invested not just uh, equity, financial equity, but also carbon. So let's think quite carefully about it, but if they are beyond redemption, then knock them down. So, I have a few other uh, slides in here. Yeah, and this is, this is kind of the wider issue of the challenge facing all of us as planners, managers, uh, those of us who have oversight over over the, the building and infrastructural process at the moment. That's just a screen grab of GDP of Ireland um, over, over the last while. Um, that's 18 years, I think, uh, 1992. Uh, doesn't, it doesn't get us as far as 2012. It is, in a sense, the, um, the inverted Nike swoosh. And this inverted Nike swoosh, it's coming up all over the place. It's a real worry. Um, basically, it involves stuff and time. And whether it be GDP or water demand in Cork or energy demand in uh, Dublin, that's the kind of generic graph that's coming up all over the place. And it's really difficult for planners to cope with that. 
to work out, well, look, do we need a 600,000 ton municipal incinerator in Dublin? Because the waste kept going like that, and then suddenly it fell off a cliff. So do we need that kind of capacity? Do we need it in terms of our motorways? Do we need it in terms of our um, uh, energy uh, generation? It comes up in every... I, I just can't get, away, can't get over how often I'm encountering that. And the problem for us as planners is we're not quite sure where we go from here. And there could be other permutations of that, kind of a, a, a boom-bust cycle again that goes up and goes down. And the real concern for all of us is how do we deal with this? How do we deal with it in terms of um, uh, transmission lines through rural areas where people are ejecting? How do, you, how do we deal with it in terms of do we have to get water from the Shannon to bring halfway across the country for Dublin? Do we have to uh, have an incinerator that can burn half a million tonnes of uh, waste? I think the only way around this is to allow for incremental development. So, in bite-sized chunks. So whether it's going to be something that, that, that is that big or that big, build it one little bit at a time. It could be a sewage plant, it could be um, a recycling location, it could be um, uh, energy, uh, energy production. <coughs> Make sure that you can do it on an incremental basis. And that helps us in a downturn to kind of say, okay, we can work quite well with what we have. Uh, and if you look back with the unfinished developments, if we built 30 houses and finished the road and the street lights and the landscaping, we'd be quite happy. And then if you did the next 20 and so on and so forth. So um, one, of the, one of the things I learned certainly from, from my time in politics, when I spent 11 years as a councillor, nine years in, in, uh, in Doyle Air, from those 20 years, I, I've learned about the kind of the, the virtues of incrementalism. You're not going to change the world overnight. Just do it slowly in bite-sized chunks and bit by bit you, you'll achieve some positive change. Uh, just a few more slides that I want to talk about. Um, one is just looking at our carbon emissions, uh, I think in the last year for which I've decent enough figures. That's probably from SEAI. Interesting. Energy, residential, transport, around about half of it is stuff that we often as planners end up having significant control over um, or should be having significant control over. When you take land use, transport, uh, energy, residential use, those are areas where planners can and should be making a difference. Uh, and I, I worry a lot about um, climate change. I think it, it is real. I think it is potentially catastrophic for developing and developed countries alike. And I think we've got to, with every single planning decision that we make, say, well, look, what would a lower carbon world look like? What would 2050 look like? Can we, can we plan this development as if we were using 150 of the energy? And I know, I, I'm an architect. I, I studied architecture before I did planning. I know we can build a zero carbon house tomorrow. I know we can do it with every single house in the state that, that will be built from now onwards. And I know as a planner, we can do amazing things with transport management, with mobility management plans, with making sure that people have the choice of walking or cycling uh, as opposed to having to drive. I want to give people those, that menu of options, and I think we owe it to ourselves uh, as planners to, to, and to future generations to make sure that we allow those options. Happen. And I really worry, this is an example, uh, a sketch from Leon Creer, where and he did this sketch maybe 20 years ago, and he, he's from Luxembourg, but the point was, he said, look, the city used to be like this, housing, civil build, civic buildings, places of work, all together. And what we've done over the last 20, well, by 1984 it wasn't so bad, but certainly by 2012, we, what we've been building is the anti-city of empty downtowns, empty city centres after dark, and huge um, commuting distances from massive, uh, massive estates, uh, from massive distances to, to our housing areas. I think we've got to, to get back to making our city centres work much better. In some cases we are. In Dublin, the inner city population has increased 60% over the last 20 years. I moved into the middle of Dublin to live. I, I grew up in in uh, rural 
uh, Dublin uh, in a very rural location with farms around me. But I just got sick and tired of waiting for buses and lifts and uh, driving and getting stuck in traffic. So I moved in between the canals 25 years ago and I haven't looked back. I love it there. And I recommend uh, that ability to just reduce the amount of travel and transport uh, in your life for the most part. So I think we've got to densify the town centres. I think we've got to think long and hard about making our city centres civilised places, whether it be in reducing the amount of one-way streets or making sure that we get people living over the shop or providing decently sized uh, apartment units. Uh, I, I think certainly we, we can do a lot in that regard. Um, that, that's a diagram uh, which takes a little bit of studying, but it's from Richard Rogers uh, Towards an Urban Renaissance from 1999. He was simply saying that we need vibrant, bustling town centres. At the centre, you should have um, mixed use, you should have higher densities, you should have decent public transport. And as we get further out, the densities go down, housing comes up. But within all of that, you need really good open spaces, you re re need really good public facilities, it could be a church, it could be a pub, it could be a, 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 a nursing home. They should be within walking distance of facilities. Look at nursing homes. We're building them on the edge of motorways, 10 miles outside the town. You go there, you die. You'll die quicker if you, don't, if you can't walk to a post office or a shop or hear a child's voice or any of those things. We've got to get back to this lovely density that works really well. Uh, and I think it's as simple as getting our town centres to be vibrant, bustling, busy places again. I think we can make that happen, we really do. I mean, it's, it's, that, that's a shot I took in Copenhagen a couple of years ago. Um, they've had a long, decent history of making really high density developments. We're not going to build 19th century buildings in, in the middle of Dublin with fantastic quality. Uh, uh, details, but I think we can provide good quality urban spaces. Uh, this roundabout was designed by an urban designer, not, not a civil engineer. It was somebody who understood that you've got to provide for pedestrian, the cyclists, decent footpaths, frontages onto this. The non the non frontage road distributor road is another one of my uh, pet hates, where we simply say a road is only for traveling; it's not for anything else. I can understand that with the motorway, but with any other road, I think we should have frontage development. We can't build Copenhagen uh, in Ireland in the morning, but we can. When we try really hard, we can provide decent public space. That's Dublin stock grants, the old campshires, the keys of Dublin, uh, where we put in decent cycling, walking facilities. Um, I know it's kind of old hat to throw in a Calatrava bridge as a symbol of urban renewal. I still think it's quite nice. The buildings themselves are high density, a little bit too much of a focus on offices for my uh, liking, but they certainly, the quality of the built environment in Docklands has improved in recent years. So finally, uh, I simply want to say that, oh yeah, I just threw in a, a, a little in, in Tullamore as well. That's no harm in putting manners on Aldi and Lidl and saying, listen, you can't build a box surrounded by cars, because if you Surrounded by cars, everybody drives there. Um, I don't know, I, I don't think any planner should give permission for uh, a single box uh, that doesn't have something on top of it. I think it's wrong, I think it, it's, it's sprawl, um, and it just compels the, the challenges of making towns work. Now, I think Little moved into that, I don't think it was built as a Little in the first instance, but there's no reason why uh, planners and shouldn't be making the case to the county manager to densify and not allow the town to drift on for five miles uh, out the road. I, I think we can do it. So, it's a tough time for planners. There's not much work out there. It's, it's really difficult to kind of say, look, how do we get involved? Uh, but I think we've got to engage with everybody else. If we're in the local authority, we've got to be hassling the economic department, uh, having coffee with the parks department, making these connections, landscaping, economic development, cultural facilities, there's all kinds of things we can do to make our cities work. If we don't do a kind of a power grab of engaging with those other areas, things won't happen. In Dunleary, the council uh, worked, uh, the planners and the cultural end of things worked to create pop-up shops. Uh, landlords knew their shops were empty and would be empty for years to come. 
They worked with the council, the families, the cultural end of things to say, look, you can go in and do something for six months and then move out. But it provides life, it brings vibrancy, it makes the, the town centre work. In, in, in the private sector, we've got to make those links for the community sector to innovation uh, to, to help us through this. I really believe the green economy is a key to all of this, and I think if we, if we try and move towards a low-carbon economy quickly, uh, we can only benefit. I'm, I'm quite upset that the current Minister for the Environment has put climate change legislation on the long finger. Uh, I think a uh, stitch in time saves nine, and by avoiding the issue, uh, it will harm us. Uh, and I think there are incredible opportunities in low carbon development and smart growth, whether it be in energy, construction, transport, or agriculture. I think there's all sorts of possibilities in that. So that is my top and safety work uh, on planning. Uh, I think there are times when we think, gosh, what do we do when we come through this? What do we need to do? But one thing is for certain, the way out of the difficulties that we're in requires more planning and not less. Thank you.